Hello, and welcome to my presentation on instance containment techniques for effective incident response. I'm Jonathan Poling, a principal security consultant for threat detection and incident response here at AWS. If you're attending this talk, odds are likely you've been involved in, an ex in or exposed to a possible incident within your AWS environment involving an instance or maybe many instances. Or maybe you haven't yet experienced such an incident, but are looking to be prepared for it should one occur. Well, either way, you're in the right place. Now, you might have seen various blog posts or presentations on how to perform instance containment within AWS, but what's the most effective method? Are there other options that haven't been discussed? Is one method better than the other? Which one should you be leveraging for your incident response processes? This presentation will provide answers to all of those questions and hopefully more by helping you better understand the variety of options available for instance containment, the pros and cons of each method, how to implement each of them step by step, and provide you with a suggested path to start building effective containment measures within your environments today. So, let's get started. We'll begin our talk with what might be a very familiar scenario for some of us involving a possible instance compromise and a series of events we might expect to occur if one's not well prepared to respond. We'll then cover the various types or levels of effective incident containment and how to implement them, followed by an alternative to simple containment that can yield additional highly valuable data sources for investigations. And we'll finish with a suggested approach for building the various capabilities within your own environments. All right, let's jump right into the scenario. Picture yourself at home. It's Saturday, 2 a.m. You're sound asleep from a long week of cloud ops engineering. You're awakened by an email notification on your phone. Uh-oh, that's the work email notification. What could it be? You see the email subject, a guard duty alert for cryptocurrency and a Bitcoin tool. Uh-oh, quickly, better get to the computer. You log into the AWS console and navigate to the involved EC2 instance. This is not good. It's a critical production web server. Should you shut it down? Wait, no. You remember there's an isolation security group set up by security staff with no rules, which allows no inbound and outbound traffic. Great. This should cut off network access until we can figure this out. You change the security group to the isolation SG on the instance and send out an email to the group. The system has been contained. Ooh, that was close. It's not over yet, but it should at least buy you some time until you get back into the office on Monday to investigate. Back to bed you go. Saturday, 8 p.m., another work email notification. You see the email subject this time, another guard duty alert for an EC2 drop point. The EC2 instance has attempted to communicate with an IP address of a remote host. What? This instance should be isolated. You try to connect to the instance using SSH, but it's blocked. As it should be, the isolation security group doesn't allow connections. Okay, so this instance should be completely isolated. Then how is it still connected to the internet? You feverishly send out emails to everyone you know begging for help. What's going on here? Sunday, 8 a.m., you've barely slept. No one has responded yet. The instance is still running, but you've got no idea what continues to go on with it. You decide to just shut it down as a last resort, but it's already been 12 hours of possible sensitive data access, and this means shuttering a critical production server. This won't be a good Monday. You know what's coming. Might be time to update that resume. Okay, so the resume part is clearly facetious. No one should be getting fired from this. But we all know that feeling, right? So what went wrong here? Well, first, we didn't have a known working or tested plan for containment. We didn't understand security group rules and their expected behavior. We allowed for additional unnecessary dwell time for the attacker within the environment. And we very possibly shuttered a critical production server and service that will come with a substantial cost to the business. Ultimately, we very possibly suffered sensitive data exfiltration. Well, why not just shut down the instance? Well, shutting down an instance does con achieve containment, but it comes at a cost. You lose valuable, volatile data from shutting down the instance. For example, memory, which can contain active processes, connections, data buffers, things that are extremely useful for an investigation, and it's all lost during shutdown. This may significantly hinder your investigation and ability to perform a root cause analysis, because you can't fix or prevent what you aren't aware of. Now, in some cases, it may make sense to just shut down, delete, and move on, but Shutdown should not be a default or go-to response in most cases. It should be a purposeful decision, planned well in advance, and in consideration of all benefits and costs. Okay, you get it. You won't just shut it down next time. Well, what should you do then? Well, here's how we can better prepare for the next time. First, we need to understand what the options even are for containment. Then, we need to define containment procedures that are specific to the threat type and the resource type, for instance, instances, data, etc. Then we need to implement containment techniques that prevent what you don't want and allow what you do, 
that are effective at varying levels of granularity from a singular instance all the way up to a VPC, and most importantly, techniques that retain and derive as much useful data as possible for leveraging investigations and understanding scope. So how do we do that? Well, I'm about to show you exactly how to do just that, implement effective containment techniques working our way up from the instance to the VPC. Well, let's see how. First, we'll set the stage with a reference architecture to better visualize our areas of focus for containment. You can see we have one instance in a security group with a network access control or NACL applied to the subnet, a route table routing traffic to and from the instance, and an internet gateway providing internet connectivity. Now your environment may have a bunch of different things in front of or behind or around each of these items, but these will be the important points of focus for implementing effective containment measures. With that reference architecture in mind, let's get into the techniques. We'll begin with security group level containment, leveraging security group rules to contain a singular instance or a set of specific instances we suspect to be compromised. Before we get into the specific techniques, let's first understand security groups and how rules work. Security groups rules begin as an implicit deny for all traffic when no rules are present. You then create rules to allow a certain traffic. Responses to inbound traffic are allowed out regardless of outbound rules and vice versa. This is how they implement stateful connections within security groups. You can assign multiple security groups to an instance, and if there's more than one rule for a specific port, Amazon EC2 applies the most permissive rule. You can add or remove rules at any time, and changes are immediately applied to the instances associated with the security group, but the effect of some rule changes, the effect of some rule changes can depend on how the traffic is tracked. Now this is the extremely important part, which perhaps you already noticed with the bold orange wording. This part is critical to implementing effective security group containment, namely with respect to understanding the difference between tracked and untracked connections. This is an area of common misunderstanding is what actually led to the instance in our initial scenario maintaining internet connectivity despite attaching a security group with no rules. So if this issue wasn't readily apparent to you in the scenario, you'll want to pay particularly close attention here. Security groups use connection tracking to track information about traffic to and from the instance. This is how they implement stateful connections, but not all flows of traffic are tracked, with one exception that ICMP traffic is always tracked. Now, untracked connections apply to traffic with a quad zero rule and a quad zero rule for all ports in the other direction, for example, an inbound quad zero and an outbound quad zero for all ports and vice versa. For these, flow of traffic is immediately interrupted if the rule that enables that flow is removed or modified. For example, if the inbound rule for an inbound connection is removed or modified, and vice versa. Now, track connections apply to traffic with a specific IP or set of rules, and you can see a couple examples there. For track connections, flow of traffic is not interrupted if the rule that enables the flow is removed or modified, regardless of the rules in the opposite direction. So can we see now where the mistake might have been made with the security groups in our scenario? Now, I know this might be a bit complicated, so let's try to visualize what we're talking about here. Here we can better visualize the difference between tracked and untracked connections and the effects of changes on each. I've labeled the tracked connections with a T and the untracked connections with a U. For the inbound rules, we can see there's one SSH rule for a specific IP, a wide open quad zero HTTP rule for both IPv4 and v6 traffic, and a wide open quad zero ICMP rule. For the outbound rules, we can see there's a wide open quad zero rule for all protocols and ports for both IPv4 and v6 traffic. In this example, if we remove the inbound SSH rule, it would not terminate any existing connections, but it would prevent any future inbound connections because we're using a specific IP here to yield a tracked connection. That means any act active SSH connection from that 203 address would remain connected despite us removing the rule. Now, if we remove either of the inbound HTTP rules, it would immediately terminate all existing HTTP connections and prevent any future inbound connections for the respective protocol because we have a corollary quad zero outbound rule for all ports yielding untracked connections. Moving down to the outbound rules, if we removed either of the outbound rules, it would prevent any future outbound connections, but it would not terminate any active connections as they would not be considered untracked due to the lack of a corollary quad zero rule inbound for all ports. In addition, it would make all new respective inbound traffic tracked. Note that ICMP traffic is always tracked, even if we remove this rule. So now we better understand how security groups work. What are the pros and cons of leveraging security group rules, for instance, containment? Well, 
It's the most granular type of containment. This provides extremely effective and targeted containment of a single instance when using separate or dedicated security groups for isolation, which we'll get to in a second. On the downside, rules can terminate only untracked connections and not tracked connections. And you can't just perform a one-click application of a pre-built isolation security group with no rules to prevent traffic. This requires a multi-step process to both terminate active connections and prevent future connections. And if it's not done exactly as described, traffic will still be possibly unknowingly allowed. So how would we perform security group level containment leveraging security group rules? The first way to do it is by leveraging the existing attached security group. We'd identify the security group attached to the, to the instance, delete all existing rules, we create a single rule of quad zero all ports for all traffic in both the inbound rules and outbound rules. This is what will convert all existing and new traffic to being untracked. We then remove the quad zero all ports inbound and outbound rules to terminate all now untracked connections. The second way to do it is by leveraging separate dedicated security groups. Now when leveraging separate dedicated security groups, you have two options. The first option involves using a single security group. For this option, you would create a dedicated isolation security group. You then create a single rule of quad zero all ports for all traffic in both the inbound rules and outbound rules. Again, application of these rules will convert all existing and new traffic to untracked. You then remove the existing security group association from the instance and associate the isolation security group with the instance. We then delete both rules with the quad zero all ports for all traffic from both the inbound rules and outbound rules of the isolation security group. Given that all of our connections were converted to untracked, deleting both of these rules would effectively terminate all connections and prevent any future ones. The second option involves using two separate dedicated security groups. For this option, you create a dedicated isolation security group that we call isolation SG step one. You create a single rule quad zero for all ports for all traffic in both the inbound rules and outbound rules. Again, this will convert all existing and new traffic to untracked. You'd create a second dedicated isolation security group, which we'll call isolation SG step two, with no rules. We then remove the existing security group association from the instance and associate the isolation SG step one security group with the instance. This will convert all existing and new traffic to untracked. We then remove the step one isolation security group from, from the instance and associate the isolation SG step two security group with the instance. And that's it. All three of these methods allow for targeted containment of a single or multiple instances leveraging security groups and rules. And no one method is better than the other. You can leverage whichever makes the most sense for your environments. Now we'll move the stack a little bit to subnet level containment, attempting to leverage an isolation subnet to perform containment. Can we just create an isolation subnet and move compromised instances into it? Sounds simple. Unfortunately, we can't because you can't change a subnet associated with a running instance. You'd have to shut the instance down before you're able to do so. But is all hope lost? Could we still leverage a method like this? Nope, not all hope is lost. And we'll investigate it in a little bit how to leverage an isolation subnet later in this presentation. So sticking with subnet level containment, we'll now attempt to leverage network access control lists or NACLs to perform containment. But before we get into the specific techniques, let's first understand how NACLs work. NACLs deny or allow traffic solely based on an external to the subnet IP or CIDR. So for inbound rules, we would specify a source, which would be an IP or CIDR external to the subnet. For outbound rules, we would specify a destination, which is an IP or CIDR external to the subnet. You can't deny or allow traffic based on an internal IP or CIDR, for example, an instance IP. NACLs are stateless, so it doesn't matter if it's a response to allowed traffic. And each NACL and included rules can be associated with only one subnet at a time. You can have a maximum of 20 rules per NACL, and you have a maximum of 200 NACLs per VPC. To better visualize how these work, let's take a look at an inbound rule for a NACL. Here we can see that for an inbound NACL rule, we must specify the source, which will be an IP or CIDR external to the subnet to which the NACL is applied. Now looking at an outbound NACL rule, we must specify the destination, which will be an IP or CIDR external to the subnet to which the NACL is applied. So as you can see, while you can filter traffic on an external address, there's no way to filter traffic on an IP or CIDR within the subnet. And we'll discuss the impacts of this in a little bit. Now you may be wondering, how are these different from security groups? Both are used to deny and allow traffic to instances. Aren't they basically the same thing? Well, there are a few key differences between them, mainly involving at which level they operate, 
For example, security groups operate at the instance level and NACLs operate at the subnet level. What they support, security groups support allow rules only while NACLs allow, uh, support allow rules and deny rules. Whether they're stateful, security groups are stateful, NACLs are not. How they're evaluated, and security groups evaluate all rules before deciding whether to allow traffic. And NACLs process rules in order, starting with the Lotus number rule and decide whether to allow traffic or not, very much like a traditional firewall. And how they're applied. So security groups apply to an instance only if someone associates it with the instance. Now NACLs apply to all instances in the subnet that it's, that it's associated with. So it provides an additional layer of defense if security groups are too permissive. Here we can better visualize again the layers at which each operates and affects traffic. You can see both security groups and NACLs are positioned to effectively limit traffic to and from instances. They just do it in different ways with different impacts at different points of the network connection. Neither is better than the other, and both can be used for effective containment depending on the situation and goals of containment. So what are the pros and cons of leveraging NACLs for containment? Well, it takes just a single inbound and outbound NACL rule to both terminate existing connections and prevent future connections. No worrying about the, the state of the connection like we did in security groups. On the downside, they can't be used in a targeted fashion to isolate a single instance. We can only block specific external IPs and ciders, and this will isolate all instances on the associated subnet. Now, this could be a pro if you're looking to isolate an entire subnet, so that's up to you. But these may require deleting an existing NACL as well in order to fit the isolation NACL rule, if your NACL rules are at maximum capacity. So make sure to remember or record any rules you have to remove in order to place these. Now, how would we perform subnet level containment leveraging NACLs? Well, you can do it one of two ways. The first is via an existing NACL. We'd identify the subnet associated with the instance, identify the NACL associated with that subnet, add a deny all NACL rule to both the inbound and outbound rules as rule number one for all traffic. Again, if you need to delete an existing rule to make space, ensure you remember what that was so you can restore it in the future if needed, right? And this denies all traffic. You can also do it via a new NACL. You can identify the VPC and associated with a VPC and subnet associated with the instance, create a new NACL within the VPC where the instance resides, and by default, the new NACL will create a single deny all rule for quad zero traffic within both the inbound rules and outbound rules, which is very convenient. You then just associate the subnet of the instance with the new NACL. Both of these methods are effective in immediately terminating all existing traffic and preventing any future traffic to and from the entire subnet associated with the suspected compromised instances without respect or consideration for the state of the connection as discussed previously with security groups. Another effective method for subnet level containment involves leveraging route tables to filter traffic to and from the instance's subnet. Route tables define and control the routing for all of your VPC subnets. And there's two main types of route tables. There's a main route table and a custom route table. Main route tables are created automatically when you create a VPC. And these control the routing for all subnets that are not explicitly associated with another route table. Custom route tables are non-default route tables you create and customize. And by default, they're created empty with no routes. Each subnet of your VPC must be associated with a route table. You can't associate a subnet with more than one route table, and subnets that aren't explicitly associated with any route table have an implicit association with the main route table. You can also associate a route table with an internet gateway or a virtual private gateway. Now, what are the pros and cons of leveraging route tables for containment? Well, the first pro is there's minimal intervention to perform containment. You simply associate a route table to a subnet. And you can have a pre-built isolation route table that's ready to go and easily able to apply. Now, you can't use these in a targeted fashion to isolate a single instance. And again, this isolates all instances on the associated subnet. In addition, this still allows intra-VPC or local routing. For example, instance to instance traffic, which is something you need to consider. Performing subnet level containment leveraging route tables can be done in three simple steps. First, you create a custom route table, which will be empty with no routes by default. You identify the subnet associated with the instance and simply associate the custom route table with the subnet of the instance. And that's it, subnet level containment using custom route tables. Moving up the stack to VPC level containment, would it be possible to perform VPC wide containment by modifying or simply removing the internet gateway? Well, let's find out. Internet gateways serve two main purposes. They provide a target in your VPC route tables for internet routable traffic, and they perform network address translation, 
NAT for instances that have been assigned public IPv4 addresses. And this supports both IPv4 and v6 traffic. So can we just attach the internet gateway from the VPC to isolate everything? That would be extremely convenient, but unfortunately we can't. You will get dependency er errors if you attempt to do this in an active environment. For example, EC2 instances with public ad IP addresses will prevent you from detaching the internet gateway until those mappings are removed. And by removed, we mean instances are shut down. And clearly shutting down every available instance in a VPC is not viable, nor wanted. So how would we do VPC level containment? Well, you could remove all the internet gateway routes from all route tables and attach a custom route table with no routes to all subnets within the VPC. There are various options depending on your needs in the situation. Uh, but whenever possible, attempt to perform the most granular level of containment achievable. This is a big hammer, so you'll definitely want to use this containment measure wisely. Okay, so we've covered a variety of ways to perform effective containment of an instance or instances by terminating and preventing all inbound and outbound traffic. Now, what if you want to isolate the instance, but you also want to maintain direct access to it, or you want to allow continued AV, EDR, what have you, telemetry monitoring and reporting? What if you still want to acquire volatile data like memory? What if you want to collect additional indicators of compromise from this instance? I propose to you all the idea of instrumented monitoring via an isolation VPC. What is an isolation VPC, you might ask? Well, this is a VPC you pre-configure, ideally located within a dedicated and effectively instrumented and limited forensics account that serves as an environment to facilitate three things, real-time system access, real-time system and network monitoring, and collection of information and intelligence from the compromised instances. So why utilize one? Well, the previous techniques we described involve performing complete isolation of an instance or instances by terminating all existing traffic and preventing any and all future traffic. While effective at pre preventing propagation of an infection, there are some consequences to such full containment techniques, namely the possibility of loss of valuable data to your ensuing investigation. This valuable data can include source IPs of the attacker, command and control activity, network data and payloads, and other attack attacker activities in progress on the system. This data can be extremely valuable in your investigations to not only help identify additional compromised systems, but to build proactive detection and prevention measures to minimize the scope and impact of the attack. This is where an isolation VPC with instrumented monitoring can be a highly effective and valuable alternative to simple full containment. Now that we've identified a new approach to containment, let's check out the pros and cons of this approach. What benefits does an isolation VPC provide over the previous containment methods we've discussed? Well, it provides effective containment while also allowing for carefully instrumented access. You're allowed to continue leveraging your AV and EDR solutions as a force multiplier for containment and response. It allows live and interactive querying and collection of data from the host. And you can continue to collect additional IOCs or indicators of compromise for use in proactively identifying additionally pop possibly compromised instances and infrastructure. Now, some of the downsides here are you must know the full sets of IPs and ports utilized by your endpoint utilities if you wish to have them continue communicating. Additionally, you must know the specific sources of connections from which you plan to connect to the host for interactive querying. And you must be very comfortable building and implementing security groups, knackles, and routes to ensure the compromised instances communications are properly limited. As I said, while this approach can be very powerful, it does take purposeful planning. And there are certain requirements and considerations for this methodology to be effective. For example, the instance will have to be shut down before it can be moved to the isolation VPC. You can't move a running instance to a different VPC, and you've got to create an AMI from the instance and relaunch that AMI in another VPC. The source IPs of actively connected attackers will need to be collected prior to instance shutdown as those will not be restarted or reinstated, and for good purpose. This can and likely should be automated through a variety of options, such as memory capture, system tools like Netstat, etc. And the efficacy of monitoring will rely on the malware and activity persisting across reboots. If the malware does not have an automated, for example, auto start method of restarting and resuming upon boot, there may be nothing to collect upon resuming it within the isolation VPC. And above all else, do not continue running a compromised instance if there's a possibility that it may propagate infection or facilitate additional unauthorized data access. When in doubt, provide a full containment of or whatever procedure is merited based on the identified and associated risk to your business. With those important considerations covered, let's get to building an isolation VPC. So how about how would you go about building such an isolation VPC? 
First, we need to build the isolation network. We'll create a VPC, again, ideally within a dedicated forensics account. We'll create two subnets, an isolation subnet and an analysis subnet. We'll create an isolation security group that allows outbound connections to monitor malware command and control. It allows outbound connections to AV and EDR endpoints for continued communications. It allows outbound connections for VXLAN traffic to analysis security group, which will be important for allowing traffic mirroring and collection. And allow inbound SSH or RDP from the analyst subnet for live querying and monitoring. We'll also create an analysis security group that allows outbound connections to isolation security group to connect to the compromised instances and allow inbound connections for VXLAN traffic from the isolation security group for monitoring. Next, we'll instrument our data, network data collection capabilities. So for traffic mirroring, if that's what we'd like to do for full PCAP collection, we'll set up a Nitro-based monitoring instance in the analysis subnet as a traffic mirror target or receiver. We'll then instrument that instance with appropriate tooling to receive and log the captured and mirrored traffic. To set up VPC flow logs for flow record collection, we'll just enable VPC flow logs for the isolation VPC. We'll then instrument our analysis instances. We'll launch and pre-configure the appropriate instances within an analysis subnet for querying the isolated instance and performing forensic analysis. And finally, we'll execute the process for isolating and monitoring a suspected compromised instance. So for the compromised instance, we'll first collect any necessary volatile data. We'll shut down the instance. We'll then create an image or AMI from the instance. Optionally, we can copy that AMI to another region if needed. And we'll share the AMI via modify image permissions with the forensics account. Now within the forensics account, we'll launch the AMI again as a Nitro-based instance within the isolation subnet of the isolation VPC. We'll then create a traffic mirror session with the following details. The traffic mirror target will be the ENI or Elastic Network Interface of the monitoring instance in the analysis subnet. The traffic mirror source will be the ENI of the compromised instance in the isolation subnet. And the traffic mirror filter will be inbound and outbound rules for all TCP and UDP traffic for quad zero, so to collect all traffic. And that's it. You've now created an environment that allows you to both effectively contain a compromised instance or instances while also collecting valuable data for your investigation. As we've seen with this instrument and monitoring approach, you can not only leverage effective containment measures, but also a variety of additional real-time data sources that can be exponentially more helpful in your investigations. From identifying command and control activity, to deriving and extracting encryption keys, to identifying and extracting malicious binaries for use in your network IDS appliances. You're not only able to contain the instance, but also identify malicious processes for AV and EDR signatures, gain additional insight into the attacker's intent and goals, leverage malicious file hashing for organization-wide search and detection, and drive myriad IOCs as force multipliers to reduce attacker dwell time, impact to the business, and return to operations. Pretty awesome, huh? Excellent. So we've discussed a variety of containment techniques and how to implement them, as well as proposed a methodology for leveraging additional valuable data sources amidst a comp possible compromise. How do you get started building your containment capabilities? Well, here I've outlined a crawl, walk, run approach to implementing effective containment techniques within your environments that you can take and start using today. First, you'll establish a dedicated forensics account and test or sandbox environment. It's a security best practice to have a dedicated forensics or security account for response. Second, you'll understand the levels of containment, security group versus subnet versus VPC, which we covered here. Hopefully these differences along with the considerations for each are a little bit clearer from this presentation. Next, we'll define containment procedures based on alert resource environment data, et cetera. These should be developed and closely tied to your business risks and threat models. We'll define failover plans for if and when a containment technique isn't effective, because as we all know, things don't always go exactly as planned. Build and test the basic containment techniques in a sandbox environment because it's important to ensure the techniques are working as expected within a sanctioned environment. We'll then implement these basic techniques within production. This will establish your baseline for effective incident containment within your environments. We'll then build and test this isolation VPC in a sandbox environment. If you choose to leverage this methodology, it will require purposeful planning and testing within a sanctioned environment. Should everything work out, we'll then implement the isolation VPC within your forensics account. This will allow you to achieve maximum benefits of both containment and data collection for investigations. And then ultimately test your plans and expectations regularly. Now number nine is last, but it's certainly not least. As we know, AWS is always involving with additional features that can be leveraged to save time and increase efficacy of operations. So make sure you're taking the time to keep your processes current, as well as keeping a pulse on which new features, capabilities, and services can make you even better at responding to possible incidents with your environments.
Thank you all for joining me in this presentation. I hope everyone learned a little something, whether just a much needed clarification, maybe even an entirely new way of performing effective incident response within AWS that you didn't know before. Stay well, stay safe, and keep building your incident response capabilities.